Welcome back to another episode of Spill the Lychee Tea with me, Trendler. Um, Today we're going to talk about the case uh, of the Dyatlov Pass. I'm going to um, talk about a few theories. We're going to read a transcript from a video of a YouTuber called Lemino, who uh, did a lot of the work to entangle this mystery. A lot of the sources that we know about are still in Russian and not translated. Um, and he put an immense, uh, immense amount of effort into translating and getting the information from uh, autopsies and um, like crime investigations um, into the English language. So we're definitely going to read that transcript just to give like an information uh, it's currently like 3 a.m in the morning and i'm really really tired um so normally we record these live on sunday in my uh in my discord server so that like a few viewers or uh, listeners can like join in live comment on it like get a few sneak peeks but because of the Easter weekend and because I'm, e uh, I'm pretty busy on the Easter weekend, we're going to um, pre-record it for um, Tuesday's release. Um, I also want to have like all the editing done by tonight because tomorrow in the morning, I already have like to pack my stuff and uh, travel. <laughs> um, it's like a work, it's like a work travel thing. Um, but yeah, so, um, the interesting thing, so about the Dyatlov Pass, basically, um, it's, it's a, it's an unsolved mystery, right? So, um, it happened in the 1960s and it's, uh, it's up to this day. There's still theories being made, um, uh, and it's, it's about nine people who went missing um, on the name-giving Dyatlov Pass and how, like, this expedition turned into a nightmare, basically. <clears throat> All right. Um, I think um, we can just start with the transcription just to give you guys more detail as to what this story is about. In early 1959, a group of hikers decided to head out on an expedition across a mountainous region of Western Soviet Union. The group consisted of nine experienced men and women greatly familiar with the Siberian wilderness. Yet, this adventure would prove to be their last. Despite a criminal investigation, photographs and journal entries, the case remains unsolved after more than half a century. This is the case of Dyatlov Pass. In the early mornings of January 23, 1959, a, a ski and hiking team of 10 boarded a train heading for the Ural Mountains in the middle of the Soviet Union. The group consisted of eight men and two women, with Igor Dyatlov as the group's leader. As the train slowly advanced deep into the mountainous Siberian taiga, the group diary received a final entry. I wonder what awaits us on this hike. Will anything new happen? Over the next few days, the group continued to altercate. Sorry. Over the next few days, the group continued to alternate between modes of transportation. First a bus, then a truck, then a horse and a sleigh, and eventually they proceed on foot and skis. On January 28th, one of the hikers named Yuri Yudin had begun to feel quite ill and eventually decided to head back while the remaining group of the nine continued as planned. Photos were taken just before they parted ways and it would be the last time he saw his friends alive. The group resumed their expedition across the snow-covered outback and documented everything of note using diaries as well as multiple cameras. Recovered photos and journal entries suggest that the trek progressed as one would expect, with no unforeseen complications. Just lots of snow, bitter cold, and an increasingly arduous landscape. 
On January 1st, they reached the foot of the mountain, known to the indigenous Mansi population as Dead Mountain. They spent the better part of the day progressing up the slope and eventually decided to set up camp only a few hundred meters from the peak. These are some of the last photos recovered from the cameras, and the last sentence of the final entry reads, It is difficult to imagine such a comfort on the ridge, with shrill howling wind, hundreds of kilometers away from human settlements. A few weeks later, friends and relatives begin to worry. No one has heard from Igor or any of the other members of the group. After much debate, a team of volunteers eventually head out to find them. On February 26th, the search party is finally able to locate the camp on the slope. It's obvious to the first at the scene that something has gone horribly wrong. The tent is in scrambles, covered by a thin coat of snow. The hiker's belonging and equipment was found orderly placed inside the tent, but the tent itself has been slashed open with a knife from the inside. The next day, nine pairs of footprints lead the research volunteers down the slope towards the nearby woods. Given that the footprints left rather mild indentations in the snow would suggest that they descended the slope in a rather calm and orderly fashion, as opposed to running away in panic. The footprints could be tracked for about half a kilometer from the tent until the trail was completely covered by snow. So they continued in the direction of the trail and under a large cedar tree at the edge of the forest next to the remains of an impro improvised campfire they found the frozen bodies of Yuri Doroshenko and Yuri Krivovnyshenko. It would take over two months for the bodies of all nine hikers to be recovered. The first two were found severely underdressed no jackets, no pants, no gloves, hats, boots, or anything else one might expect from the f given the frigid cl climate. Only light shirts, underpants, and socks. At the time of their death, it would have been around minus 30 degrees Celsius. The cedar tree had signs of damage as if someone had climbed it, with branches broken up to 5 meters high. Perhaps they were attempting to locate the tent in the pitch black darkness, or perhaps they were trying to hide from someone, or something. The next three hikers were found at varying distances between the tent and the tree covered by a few centimeters of snow. They were better dressed than the previous two, but not by much as they still lacked essential items such as boots, hats, and gloves. They were all found facing the direction of the tent as if they were struggling to return, at the moment of death. While some of them had sustained minor injuries, all five had died of hypothermia. It should also be noted that four of them had died while intoxicated. The last four hikers were found at the bottom of a small hill covered by three meters of snow. 75 meters from the tree in the opposite direction of the tent. Three of them had sustained lethal injuries. One had a fractured skull and two had fractured multiple ribs and suffered massive internal bleedings. The medical examiner believed the injuries had been sustained from a fall and compared it to a car crash. The injuries had been sustained while they were still alive and could not have been inflicted by another person. Two had also been found with gaping eye sockets, and one of the women had a missing tongue. The last of the four had a broken nose and a deformed neck, but he died of hypothermia. Most mysterious of all, three articles of clothing were later found to be abnormally radioactive. On May 28th, the criminal case was discontinued with a cryptic and incredibly vague conclusion. The lead investigator writes in the final report, the cause of death was an unknown compelling force which the hikers were unable to overcome. Not exactly the most satisfying answer and barely a conclusion at all. That much about the transcription of Lemino. Um, everything after this point, so the 
the the video like goes on to make its own um its own conclusions as to what could have happened um i don't want to go too deep into that you can watch let me know this video i'm going to uh, post a link uh in the youtube description but also in the description of the episode um but for us that should be enough the factual report and translation that he provided us uh, to understand what happened here <clears throat> now there are a lot of like explanations um i'm also going to go into like a factual like or a more down-to-earth kind of explanation and then i'm going to go into like what might have happened if you see it as something more mysterious i guess maybe something spiritual um first of all <laughs> If, if like a local population no matter like who they are like native indians or in this case the mansi people if they call a place dead mountain that's a dead giveaway for you to not go there all right like if 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 you come across someone saying like hey what's this mountain called and they are like oh it's dead mountain don't go there like <laughs> Like, that's like a red flag, right? That's like a sign that says, like, GTFO. Just, just don't. Now, um, a very, f like, down-to-earth explanation to this, um, uh, that let me know and also one of the authors of a book about this incident have is that the tent, uh, from the inside caught fire, right? Because we're talking about the sub-zero temperatures here so you don't make a fire outside of a tent like normally if you're like camping outside right uh in america or europe in like um like not not sub-zero temperatures you to make a fire you either have like an open fire like with stones surrounding the fire pit so that the fire can't like jump over to other things like uh, grass or or leaves or trees and stuff like that or you dig a small hole so that you have like a like a pit fire it's called right so so that is how you make a fire like in in, in like normal climate i would almost say but like in uh, sub-zero temperatures you can't do that because outside you're gonna freeze to death like it's it's just going to take up a lot of energy and you don't you want to avoid that so um the tent had a stove um with like an exhaustion pipe built inside uh, so that you can have a fire inside of the tent basically so that they can cook food and and keep themselves warm um the theory that let me know goes on with here is that that stuff um they pack it up and like put it away because it was found it was found packed up so his theory is that they try to uh like to 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 wrap it up and get it back into like a package and stuff but there were still like coals and stuff right like things that you are not going to take with you basically like waste from a fire so these like hot charcoals um drop and start burning different things like jackets clothes um other type of equipment that can um start a fire and create like a lot of smoke now four of these people were already intoxicated so they were already like dr maybe drunk maybe like dead as drunk right like maybe they passed out from being drunk we don't know about that we just know that they definitely had alcohol or other forms of intoxication in their body so let me know goes on to say that like the fire stars that try to like put out the fire there is signs of like um of like burned clothes um, inside of the tent when it was found they tried to put out the fire but it was not possible um, so they slash open the tent from the inside and then they uh, try to find a different place to stay now they knew that like on the on the um, 
like that like a few kilometers down the slope where they were resting and building up their camp was a forest now if you don't have like a secondary like tent or anything what you want to do is like try to find a cave or a forest or something like that that gives you at least a bit of like protection against um against the, we the weather so that's where they were headed um and like on the way there like some people decided to go back that's how they were like people struggling and facing towards the tent who died of hypothermia and some people who stayed like in the vicinity of the of the fire right and they also froze to death and then there were the four people who's like kind of in the middle of this and possibly like while moving back towards the tent with the other two um they fell down into um into a pit now a theory is that there was like a mini avalanche that caught these four and slammed them into that pit uh into that ravine that was there um breaking the bones breaking like multiple um ribs and stuff like that uh then there was the cedar tree where someone tried to climb up that also might have been like a way of them like trying to relocate um the tent right um and then everyone basically either dying from dying from internal injuries or from um from like hypothermia that's like that's like a very down to earth like um theory but again this is still an unsolved case nothing has been proven or unproved um so there's also like the thing about like missing her tongue uh, like one of the people, um, Dubinina, was missing her tongue, and a few other people were like missing eyes, like the eye sockets were like, um, like empty and stuff like that. Um, all of these people are presumably the people that were in the ravine and covered by like three meters of snow. It is. It is. It's, um, the, like, the report just goes on to say that she was missing her tongue. It's neither stated if it was cut off, ripped out, or anything else. Um, though it does, like, I don't know what happens. I don't know what happens to your tongue after you're dead. Like, let's, let's just imagine you're, there's an avalanche. You're, you're, um. You're covered in snow, right? You can't get out. You can't move anything. Your mouth is slightly open. Could it be, just as a fury, could it be that the tongue freezes and then while digging her out, the tongue breaks off and it's lost? Because it's also not stated anywhere that the tongue was still found, right? It's just like the tongue is missing. Because I can't imagine like the t I can't imagine like when you're like buried by snow and your eyes are open, right? And like a lot of like snow enters your like eye sockets and then it thaws that it like that it destroys your eyes and basically liquefies your eyes. I can imagine that happening. But I cannot imagine the same happening to a tongue. And if it did, why did it not happen to like all of them? Right? The eyes, the eyes um, missing was, I think, two people. So peop two people like from the four that were like covered in three meters of snow in the ravine were missing their eyes uh, while two still kept it. So, I mean, of course, there's always the the possibility that they were attacked by something in the snow um, that then took away the eyes and the the tongue you know i mean this is a prime example of how like a russian 
Bigfoot uh, story would go, I guess. Also, one of the questions is why would they split up? You know, like as as they are so they are experienced. Sorry. So they are experienced explorers and experienced like um, like hikers. Why would two of them stay back at the fire while two of them go back? Is it like did they have like a did they have like a like an like a plan or did they have like an argument and they split up because of that? Another question is also like the time that passes between the people that are caught in the avalanche, the people returning to the tent and the people staying at the fire. Like there's not a lot of information about that because obviously like no one really knows, right? But like so the, the footsteps go away from the tent. They, like, let's imagine the situation. They all go away from the tent. They arrive at the forest and they start a fire. Now, they split up. It's nine people, right? So they split up three people, uh, five people, four people. The first four people go back and are then caught by the small avalanche. Not a big one, just a small enough that it catches them and pushes them into the ravine and crushes their skulls, their ribs, their 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 bones, right? Afterwards, of the five people that are left, three split off and go back and they're like hey we go back we look at the tent if it's like still fine or not if it is we come back and get you guys and the two people stay there those three people never find the tent because it's too dark it's too snowy and the even the tent was like it was not buried in snow but it was like it was there was a fake a thin layer of snow on top of it right so they try and climb up to the tree. They look for the tent, if it's anywhere. If, if you can see the smoke, maybe uh, still. Uh, they don't find it. They move towards the general direction of where the tent would have been. And they die of hypothermia while doing so. The two at the fire wait and they wait and they wait. Hoping for people to come back and tell them. That could have been what happened. That could have been what happened. That would be the most down-to-earth explanation, basically. Another theory is that um, not like the coal or a fire um, got them out of the tent, but it was more that there was a sound resembling an avalanche that m put them into high alert. Because it, it has to be so, like the tent was sliced open from the inside as like an emergency exit. So they it had to be done fast. Two of them were still in their like undergarments, right? Like just a light t-shirt or not t-shirt, but like a light jacket and uh, underpants. So the, the danger that has them exiting the safety of their tent has to be so big that they were evaluating death from hypothermia as less dangerous as whatever is coming for them right now so an avalanche might also have been like or the sound of an avalanche uh, might have been what caused them to slice open the tent from the inside and leave one of the most disturbing factors is that they moved out of the tent very, very, in a very orderly fashion. There are pictures, there, there are photos of like the footsteps away from the tent and they're really orderly. It's like, it's like a duck family, like everyone, it's a single file, everyone stepping into the, trying to step into the footsteps of the one in front of them. Um, if there's something like one might think that if there's something like an avalanche approaching that you would try to move down that place faster there's also reports of like different other things 
um, for example, that on the night where presumably they died, that um, that a light was seen in the sky. So um, there's also like a lot of like um, there's also a lot of like theories about like UFOs and stuff like that. Um, you know what? Let's. I'm I'm going to continue with the transcri uh, transcription here, just to give you because there's still a bit more of information to get out of this like uh, transcription. Again, this is uh, a transcription of Let Me Know's uh, video, um, and again, I I am going to put down a few links in the description. The fact that Dubinina was missing her tongue has been taken way out of proportion. Some say it was cut off or ripped out while she was still alive. Others say it was eaten by scavengers after death, while some even claim the tongue was later found somewhere else. But I, let me know, read the medical reports, and this is what it says. The diaphragm of the mouth and the tongue is missing. That's it. There's nothing about cutting or ripping or anything. I don't know how or where it began, but there seems to be an ex exaggerated importance placed on this missing tongue, while in reality it's a rather minor detail. At least the medical examiner believed it to be a minor detail, otherwise he would have elaborated further. For example, the same section of the same report states, gaping orbits, the eyeballs are absent. Equally mysterious, right? Well no, because the medical examiner does provide an explanation for both. Soft tissue injuries to the head are post-mortem post changes, putrefaction and decomposition to Dubinina's corpse, which was recently exposed to water prior to detection. He even adds putrefaction and decomposition, in parenthesis to clarify exactly what he means. And this was not even exclusive to Dubinina, as the four last bodies were all damaged due to the melting snow. Now, some who claim that her tongue must have been removed while she was still alive have pointed to the fact that she had about 100 grams of blood in her stomach. But that's not exactly true either. The, re the relevant uh, portion of the forensic examination reads, the stomach contained up to 100 cent uh, cubic centimeters of a uh, dark red slimy mass. That's about 10 centiliters of something, most likely food, mixed with something red, most likely blood. So we don't know how much blood was in her stomach, just that there was blood in her stomach. Which isn't that strange given that she was suffering from massive internal bleedings. One of the most mysterious aspects of this case is that three separate articles of clothing discovered on two of the bodies were found to be radioactive. Which does indeed sound a bit mysterious, but you have to keep in mind that almost everything is slightly radioactive. So we need more details. And the radiological studies claim that under normal circumstances, an area of 150 square centimeters should not exceed 5,000 disintegrations per minute. Only three articles of clothing exceeded or equaled that limit at 5,000 dpm, 5,600 and 9,900. The only explanation given in the reports is that the clothes were contaminated as radioactive dust fell from the atmosphere, or the clothes were susceptible to contamination when in contact with radioactive substances. In other words, they were unable to determine exactly how the clothes were contaminated. But it's not unrealistic to it to believe it was uh, it to be part of a natural process. But just in case it wasn't due to the elements, there may be an alternative explanation. Kolevatov had previously worked at a facility developing nuclear materials, and Krivonyshenko had previously worked at a top-secret plutonium production plant for nuclear weapons. And the three articles of radioactive clothing belonged to Kolevatov and Krivonyshenko. Now, this is this is kind of making me question the reliability of this. Um, of this assumption that let me know is making because like every time someone says something is like top secret right like i'm really skeptic so he says 
uh, that, um, I mean, I can like, I can believe that Kolevatov had previously worked at a facility developing nuclear materials, but like Kivon Nishenko previously working at a top secret plutonium production plant, unless there's like proof for that, like there's like a statement about that, like 30 or 40 years later, uh, releasing valuable information about that. Um, then I can believe that. But like, if it's just like, if it's just him saying like, oh, he worked at an like super top secret, like plutonium production plant. Like, I don't know if I should believe that or not. All right. No matter what the reason was why they felt like it, they had to leave the tent, they left it. One or more of them made the decision to head to the nearest shelter, which they would know to be the woods. The reason for this decision is likely multifaceted. The smoke from the tent, or whatever made them leave, uh, made it impossible to stay within its proximity and or the smoke. It may have caused them to believe that the tent was on fire or that an avalanche was coming or anything else. Some of them were intoxicated, which could have affected their judgment as well as their sensibility to the cold and they may have also believed to be closer to the woods than they actually were so they finally reached the woods and immediately set out to make a fire which worked some climbed the tree and scavenged the surrounding area while those who are more properly dressed head a bit deeper into the woods about 75 meters from the tree four of them trigger a minor avalanche taking them over the edge of a ravine with a drop of about three meters as the bottom is filled with rocks and ice, they sustain lethal injuries. Three of the other hikers of the other five hikers decide to head back for the tent, while the remaining two slowly freeze to death around a fading flame. That is the end of the transcription. I left out the thing about the UFO because it's just I do believe in the paranormal. I do not think that extraterrestrial beings had anything to do. Because I'm not saying that there aren't any t extraterrestrial beings. I don't. I'm not saying that there are no aliens. But why? Like why? No, I don't. I don't think this has anything to do with aliens. Like honestly, I mean, there's yet to be a story that like convinces me that that aliens have already visited us and done a few crazy shit. Uh, but. Like, not in this case. I do think, though, that, like, again, there there are theories about, like, a Russian kind of, like, Bigfoot trying to, like, uh, do stuff. Also, like, we're talking about very experienced hikers here. Like, I do not think that the four, the four hikers that were, like, caught by that avalanche, that they, um that they would trigger something like that, right? They were careful enough. They were careful enough. Let's say that the theory is right, that like they started accidentally started a fire inside of the tent and they left the tent. They left it in such an orderly manner, which could be because they were such experienced hikers, because they knew that like the danger wasn't an avalanche, but the danger was the fire. But they didn't want to trigger another avalanche, like another like hazardous event so they they retreated to the forest in an uh, in an organized manner as to not trigger another avalanche how would they go then inside of the forest go and like search for other materials maybe a place where they could, they could like be even more protected from the weather and trigger a minor avalanche it's possible of course everyone like has a bad day and and they were uh, intoxicated they had like bad equipment it is possible it is it is not impossible but i i think it's highly unlikely that after after doing everything to ensure that an avalanche doesn't happen that they come into the forest and they they um trigger an avalanche there another thing that you guys have to also consider is their trek to dead mountains was well known People saw them taking the bus, the train, the hike, the sleighs. They were seen on their way there. And they even had contact with like local, uh, the local Muncie population, which told them that this is called 
that mountain, right? Now, sometimes, sometimes, strangers are not very welcome in indigenous places. I do not know if this place has like some religious or spiritual like importance to the local population, but it is not impossible, right? And sometimes local people will do a lot to protect local secrets. Um, and like, again, like if they know if they know that they're there, maybe they could have, like, pretended to make sounds like an avalanche is happening to force them outside of the tent and in the forest prepare, like, an ambush and trigger that minor, minor avalanche to kill four of them. The two who were at the fire possibly being the most vulnerable without any clothes left to die of hypothermia and this like while a second group for example puts down the fire or whatever uh all the lights at, around the tent so that the free people who are trying to get back to the tent will never find their way back because if you think about it if it's like really on fire or if they left it in a hurry, they would not have turned down lights and stuff like that. But it must be really, it must have been really hard to like find their way back because like no lights, nothing was like back. But again, that is just a theory, a game theory. And um, with that, I leave you to your own, um, to your own imagination you yourself like can decide for yourself if this is like the work of of a mysterious being maybe like the locals trying to cover up secrets or um yeah or just like an incredible in like accident you know i just remember like one of the hikers did go back because he was feeling ill so I don't know, like, he could have suggested, like, hey, like, camp at this area on the slope of the peak of that mountain, then pretend to be ill, go back, tell them that, like, they are most likely going to be there, and that they are going to take shelter in the woods because they're experienced. If he knows them well, could be. Who knows? It's a it's a un, it's an unsolved mystery even 60 70 years afterwards it's still it's still not a closed case there's still people documentaries uh trying to find out what could have happened there and we'll never know um but yeah thank you guys so much for listening in to my podcast for the people on YouTube thank you so much for watching um I'm Tranly, and you guys are awesome. Have a have a pleasant day. And if you guys have any ideas for other um, unsolved mysteries that you guys want me to research, feel free to to put them in the comments below. Also, um, don't forget to like and subscribe to the YouTube channel, and to follow the podcast on spotify apple podcast or any other platform that you're listening in on and um yeah thank you so much for supporting and see you guys next time